I love Blade Runner. It sounds sappy, but both films are among the most personally significant things I know. That said, if you don't like Blade Runner, you're correct. You're also in good company, because the first time I watched the film, I didn't feel much. And then I loved it. And then I watched its sequel, and I hated it. And then I loved it. And for a long time, I thought the takeaway was that I am an indecisive doofus. And I am an indecisive doofus. But also, I've come to the conclusion that hating and then loving Blade Runner is a core element of the Blade Runner experience. Its own production history consists of the people most responsible for Blade Runner's existence having a reluctant Stockholm syndrome relationship with the project, where seemingly every positive emotion was preceded by a negative one. It's a story filled with rejection and acceptance and dislike and then begrudging and finally enthusiastic love. It's a crazy story with only one clear lesson. If you currently don't like Blade Runner, you will. The first person to not like Blade Runner was its own granddaddy, visionary science fiction author Philip K. Dick, who, having written Blade Runner's source novel, read a draft of Blade Runner's script and said, It was just one terrible screenplay. It was intrinsically disappointing, it was terribly corny, and uh, it was, it was uh, extremely uh, maladroit throughout. I mean, it, 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 it Okay, in terms of what it was trying to do, uh -huh. it didn't do that well. I did not approve of what it tried to do, and I did not think it accomplished what it tried to do. But like me, and eventually you, Philip later saw some footage from Blade Runner and said, It was the greatest 20 minutes I ever experienced. Oh yeah, it's good, huh? It's, it's, we, we came out in shock. Mary and I came out in a state of shock. In fact, when I closed my eyes, I could still see that opening sequence. I spent about a month thinking over what I'd seen. And I realized that Blade Runner will be one of the biggest information dumps, you know, firing information at you that exists in the modern world. In order to unpack Philip K. Dick's Stockholm Syndrome, we need to look at where it started. In 1968, Philip wrote a novel called Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? It sat basically untouched until 1977, when a little-known writer spent $10,000 to option its rights. That writer was Hampton Fancher, a man whose first name sounds as much like a last name as his last name does, and on the surface that story might have sounded inspiring. A cinematic masterpiece spawned by a young writer with nothing more than a dream and apparently $10,000. But in Fancher's own words, his motivation to adapt the novel was, quote, but I thought, okay, that's commercial, here's a through line. Real quick, we should float in the swimming pool of irony that Blade Runner, the notoriously box office bombing, generationally defining work of art, began as an attempt to Make some money. That's all we're talking about is making some money. It gets worse. I know a drinking game for my channel would be to take a shot every time I mention The Lord of the Rings, but where its trilogy was successful, in part because of the love and respect its filmmakers had for its author, Blade Runner's source novel caused Hampton Fancher to say, He said, well, there's a book called An Android Stream of Electric Sheep, and I said, okay, I'll read that. I read it. I didn't like it that much. This tepid reaction was also shared by Blade Runner's eventual director, Ridley Scott, who didn't even take the time to read the novel he was adapting, saying, quote, I'm afraid I never fully read it. I couldn't get through it. The difference between Peter Jackson and Ridley Scott is the difference between This should ultimately be Tolkien's film, it shouldn't be ours. And The film that I make at the end of the day is my movie. So yes, it's my movie. I want to present something that will be a through line to this video. Ridley Scott seems like a tool. Hey! Unsurprisingly, this creative alliance did not produce work that Philip K. Dick deemed satisfying. And I came into this backstory expecting Philip to be a temperamental, overprotective author, but he comes across as pretty reasonable, explaining that It really wasn't so much what they had left out that bothered me, because I do know that things have to be left out when you transfer a novel to a screenplay. I mean, there's just no, there's just no way around it. This idea is echoed by director Denis Villeneuve when he says When you do an adaptation, there's a brutal moment when you need to destroy the original. But what the author didn't accept was the script's use of what he considered to be hacky, cliche, voiceover narration, saying, Execution of the script is bad because what he had done was he relied on the, the old, overworked, really cliche-ridden figure of 
Philip Marlowe and Sam Spade. And then the voiceover, you know, it was a dirty town, it was a dirty job, someone had to do the job. And that was the way the script went. It literally had voiceover, and, and it had that same kind of voiceover. He also disliked the film's formulaic ending, which, quote, conformed to that god-awful generic convention where the good guy beats the bad guy before linking arms with the love interest and walking off together into the night. So really it was, you know, kind of a bumbling effort from start to finish, and I said so, and uh, Dad got back to the studio, and I know because I'm the one who turned it over to him. By this point, their relationship had deteriorated to where Philip K. Dick believed if he and Ridley Scott were to meet, Ridley, quote, might just pop me one. It was here, at the lowest point, that an unlikely spark ignited the author's passion for Blade Runner. As a new co-writer was hired onto the project, Ridley, of course, directed this new writer to not read Philip's novel, saying, quote, don't bother. But to literally everyone's surprise, this new co-writer named David Peoples produced a script that appealed to all of the people. After I read the later version that worked David the people that committed, because his is so much better that virtually everything that I had been saying was was no longer applicable. In fact, it was diametrically uh, null. This new writer, however, underplays his own contributions and attributes many of the changes to Ridley Scott himself, referring to Ridley as, quote, really the author of Blade Runner but never passing up an opportunity to tinge a happy moment with a little biting garnish, the appropriately named Philip K. Dick responded to this, saying, Now, Peebles is uh, evidently upset that I, uh, that I uh, uh, praise him so highly, because it puts Peebles in an awkward position. But this is not my problem. I, I mean, I have no objection to singling him out, you see, so I'm going to assume until proved otherwise, since it's D David Peebles' name on the script, that he's the one who did it. But this little spat couldn't extinguish the embers of positivity that for the first time warmed the production of Blade Runner. Like a gesture of goodwill between adversarial nations, Philip K. Dick was brought in after filming was completed and shown a highlight reel of what the Blade Runner team was creating. And it was this footage that prompted him to say, It was the greatest 20 minutes I ever experienced. Describing his excitement to watch Blade Runner as, quote, like a kid on Christmas Eve. I can't wait to see Blade Runner. They'll have a rough cut pretty soon. This sounds like a happy ending, but the history of Blade Runner is punctuated with many moments that should be happy endings, but they never quite are. At least not yet. Mere days after his Kid on Christmas Eve quote, Philip K. Dick suffered a stroke that would lead to his death two weeks later, dying before ever seeing an actual cut of the film he inspired. In that very same month, Blade Runner was finally test screened to audiences who were so confused at what they were seeing, many people walked out of the theater mid-showing. Because of this confusion, and because Blade Runner was far over its budget, the studio executives decided to make some changes. And those changes were to reinsert both the voiceover and the kind of quote, bumbling ending Philip hated. However, the ghost of the author had a very much alive advocate against these changes, in the form of the movie's star, Harrison Ford, who equally loathed both of those edits. The driving off into the sunset. Didn't buy it. Didn't believe it. Looked like it came from another movie to me. Ford goes on to explain that removing the voiceover from the script was, quote, the key condition to my involvement in Blade Runner. We'd agreed up front, no narration. And for a different movie, the idea of voiceover might seem like a silly thing to be this upset about. Yes. After all, if your film is confusing, narration sounds like a great way to clear up moments of ambiguity. But I'd argue the reason it rubs so many people the wrong way is because ambiguity is a core element of Blade Runner. It's a movie that requires the audience to form their own interpretation of what's actually going on. That's the beauty of something that's good, I guess, you know, you can, it's ambiguous. It's, it's just the question mark is what's interesting. The answer is stupid. And so what began as annoyance when Ford was called into the recording booth. 23. Dying, making every second count. Sorry. We, I'm breaking my heart here. And he's laughing. Became anger when the studio fired Ridley Scott and gave the task of writing the new narration to someone who, until that point, had no involvement with Blade Runner. The final versions of the narration were done uh, without Ridley, and I missed him. And there was a guy, obviously the author of what uh, I was to read, and I thought, this guy is so far away from the process that I, I mustn't uh, fall into the trap of trying to discuss this with him and uh, go home because I had arduously argued through other versions to try and get the best version that we could of the 
narration, even though I didn't think it was necessary. Many people believe that Ford's frustration caused him to sabotage the recording by giving line reads so terrible the studio couldn't possibly use them. Ford telling the press, quote, I thought that it was so bad there was no f chance in hell that they were going to use it. But Ford did deny the rumor that he intentionally bombed the recordings, possibly because it's false or because it's true, but it didn't work. Because when Blade Runner premiered a couple months later in 1982, audiences were treated to the dulcet tones of Harrison Ford possibly or possibly not trying his best. You can decide for yourself. I'd quit because I'd had a belly full of killing. But then I'd rather be a killer than a victim. Replicants weren't supposed to have feelings. Neither were Blade Runners. What the hell was happening to me? Star Wars The Phantom Menace was the most disappointing thing since my son. Worst of all, this studio intervention did not make Blade Runner more palatable to audiences, giving as bad a first impression to the world as its original script did to Philip K. Dick. Bumbling effort from start to finish. Not only was the movie panned by some of the day's most important critics, it also failed to even make back its budget, which hurts because... That's all we're talking about is making some money. <sighs> By this point, if I were you, I'd be wondering if Blade Runner was both a critical and commercial failure, aka all of the failures, how did it eventually become what we know it to be today, as in a movie that you still probably don't like? The answer is luck. Or in the words of Galadriel... But something happened then. Blade Runner... Did not intend. It was picked up by the most unlikely creature imaginable. Quoting Paul Salmon's Future Noir, an excellent Bible of Blade Runner's production history, in 1989, seven full years after Blade Runner premiered and bombed, a stereo film preservationist named Michael Eric was performing his routine duties as asset manager for his division of Warner Brothers Pictures, when he made a most unusual discovery. Metal film cans marked with the following words, Technicolor, 70 millimeter, Blade Runner. What Eric discovered was the Christmas present Philip K. Dick was looking forward to so many years earlier, which was also the cut that caused those test audiences to storm out of the theater. He found the presumed lost version of Blade Runner without narration or cheesy ending. Only after that had been uh, dissected from uh, the film that I got any pleasure out of seeing that movie. The only problem was that Eric didn't know what he got his hands on. Being unaware that an alternative cut of Blade Runner even existed, he had no reason to watch what he believed to just be the standard movie he knew in an unusual 70mm format. And so the film continued to collect dust until, I'm not making this up, a local film festival that exclusively screened 70mm prints happened to request a copy of a 70mm Blade Runner from Warner Brothers. By this point, Blade Runner had developed a small cult following, and so the theater was filled when the lights went out and the movie began to roll. In Eric's own words, it only took me a couple of minutes to realize that what I was watching was a version of Blade Runner I was completely unfamiliar with. Needless to say, I then became very excited. I and everyone else in that theater knew we'd seen something special. People were even hanging around in the lobby after the show, holding little discussion groups trying to figure out what the heck it was they'd just seen. But as cute of a story as that is, Warner Brothers didn't believe the enthusiasm of a couple hundred film buffs would be replicated if they were to release this cut to a wider audience. And so they effectively let it collect more dust for another three years until it was finally loaned out to a small theater in Los Los Angeles. But instead of causing its audiences to flee in confusion and or boredom, this work print of Blade Runner was now drawing in bigger capacities than the theater could even hold. Again, quoting Salmon's book, lines began to form around the block hours before each performance, and suddenly this nearly 10-year-old film was the hottest ticket in town. These sold-out screenings became so popular that Blade Runner's original writer, Fancher Hampton, couldn't even get a seat, waving his passport in front of the ticket booth, saying, quote, hey, Hey look, I'm the guy who helped write this movie. I'm willing to buy a ticket, but can't you squeeze me in somehow? But on some level, this must have delighted him. That's all we're talking about is making some money. This wider enthusiasm sparked Warner Brothers and Ridley Scott to release a tweaked and enhanced version called Blade Runner's Director's Cut. And here's where things get weird. 
By now we've seen Philip K. Dick go from disliking Blade Runner to loving Blade Runner. The general population has gone from disliking Blade Runner to loving Blade Runner. Nearly everyone now loves Blade Runner, except for one person, Ridley Scott. The director of Blade Runner doesn't really like Blade Runner's director's cut, which is a problem because At the end of the day is my movie. Ridley is quoted as saying the so-called director's cut isn't really. You might ask, why? The general consensus is that while the new cut was being assembled, Ridley's attention was mostly consumed by his next movie, Thelma and Louise. The other reason is Ridley Scott seems like a tool. Hey. It was always raining. It was always dark. You so said, why is it always raining when it's dark? Because I f***ing wanted it to be that way, okay? And so, for the next 15 years, Ridley Scott's dissatisfaction with Blade Runner had no remedy. Because Warner Brothers, having just sunk money into an alternative cut, wasn't keen on sinking even more money into an alternative alternative cut. What Ridley needed was a special event that would justify another re-release. Something like Blade Runner's 25th anniversary. And so, in 2007, Ridley finally had the opportunity to release Blade Runner's quote, final cut. Or in the words of Salmon's book, an honest to God at long, long last, director approved, this time it's for real, final cut. The majority of this cut's tweaks are practical, like smoothing out its audio and removing visual mistakes. But in what sounds like a joke, Ridley actually wanted to insert new voiceover narration. But when he asked if Harrison Ford would be willing, he received a reply that read, quote, no way. But despite his failed attempt at narration, Ridley still managed to piss off Harrison Ford. Because the Final Cut's biggest and most controversial change, the thing actually responsible for turning Ridley Scott's Blade Runner frown upside down, was to ugh, insert a unicorn into the movie that everyone besides Ridley Scott seems to hate. That's an insane sentence, and since a lot of people already know what I'm talking about, I'll just quickly explain. During the production of Blade Runner, Ridley would occasionally reference a quote, unicorn, that no one understood because it wasn't in the script and Ridley refused to explain it. Blade Runner's editor, Terry Rawlings, recounts, the money people kept pestering Ridley with questions like, what's with this unicorn? What does it mean? Ridley would reply, quote, if you don't get the unicorn, what's the point in me explaining? which is a sentence I can't not read in the voice of a sobbing 13-year-old girl. But what it means is this. In Ridley Scott's head, Blade Runner's protagonist Rick Deckard is secretly the same kind of android he spends the movie hunting down. The unicorn comes into play during a moment where Deckard is drunk and has a vision or weird memory of one running through a forest. By that point, the film has already established that replicants are implanted with artificial memories that are known by their human creators. Implants. Those aren't your memories, they're somebody else's. And this becomes significant during the film's ending, when a different Blade Runner drops an origami unicorn outside Deckard's apartment, revealing to Deckard and to the audience that the police department knows Deckard's thoughts, unequivocally making him a replicant. I repeat, this was not in the script. Co-writer David Peoples saying, I didn't think for a minute that Deckard was a replicant. Or in the less diplomatic words of Blade Runner producer Michael Dealey, quote, that unicorn was Ridley's soul and personal obsession. Just a bit of bull extra layer Ridley put in. But given the disastrous way Blade Runner's production ended, with the studio taking away Ridley's control of the movie, he never got to really actualize it. Besides an attempt in the director's cut he was always unsatisfied with. But with Blade Runner's final cut, Ridley could finally have the unicorn he always wanted. But without exaggeration, every meaningful creative voice involved in Blade Runner did not like the unicorn on the basis that its presence would do more to destroy the film's emphasis on ambiguity than the controversial voiceover narration ever could. There were always debates about whether Deckard was a replicant, but in one swift move, Ridley stuck an unwelcome period on the end of one of the film's most intriguing question marks. Harrison Ford says his unicorn frustration was equal to his narration frustration. Whenever I thought that I was uh, possibly being um... Uh, positioned as a replicant, I would, I would seek out Ridley and argue against it. Voicing his opinion that Deckard's identity should never have been confirmed. Because then that question will go away and people will not have that pleasure. 
of debating it. Hampton Fancher also disagrees with the choice, saying, I don't think anything should, should show that Deckard's a replicant. If you think that, you're already wrong. I thought if he was a replicant, then the game's over. And when Ridley put in the, you know, the ostensible evidence that he is, I didn't, I didn't like that. But this was Ridley's own arc of dissatisfaction turned to love for Blade Runner. Ridley went so far as to shove this non-consensual unicorn on the cover of new Blade Runner releases. Because I don't know if you recall, but Blade Runner is... It's my movie. But do you know what is not Ridley Scott's movie? The sequel, Blade Runner 2049. And while Ridley's fingerprints are on the early stages of the film, everyone else was on team ambiguity. The fact that it's a question is what's important. It's that the chasing for authenticity is both baked into the narrative of the story and to the meta-narrative of the film, that there is no authentic answer to that question. This sentiment was shared by Blade Runner 2049's director, Denis Villeneuve. One of the reasons I love sci-fi is because it's like it, it allows you in a very dynamic, dynamic way to approach existential questions. For me, I, I love the question. The answer is less interesting for me. Yeah. Denis going so far as to cite Philip K. Dick's source novel for this. I found the, the, the answer in a, a Philip K. Dick novel where the characters, they are doubting about themselves. If Ridley Scott was sitting here, he would look at me and said, what the hell is he talking about? So he will, he will, because he, he, uh, but me, I love the fact that uh, Descartes is doubting about his own identity. Even him is un, isn't sure about that, that I love. Yeah. That for me is like uh, what is a part of the movie is about. This makes Denis the first major creative voice involved in any Blade Runner production to speak favorably about Philip K. Dick's novel. This is also symptomatic of a larger theme, which is Ridley Scott and Denis Villeneuve seem to be as antithetical of both directors and human beings as one could possibly imagine. Where Ridley Scott's views on collaboration consist of Because I know what I want, so by the time I get I know exactly what I'm going to do. By being confident that I know exactly what I'm doing, I knew exactly what to do. So I don't like discussion. I know exactly what I want. I want to walk in and say, do it. My film, the film that I make at the end of the day is my movie. It may be a team thing as well, but I'm taking the knocks, I'm taking the bashes, and probably I've developed it, etc. Et so yes, it's my movie. And I'm inviting people to come in and do it, and that's what a director is. Whereas Denis leaps at the opportunity to share ownership of his films with his collaborators. Roger was part of the birth of the cinematic language of Blade Runner 2049 from the start. So I felt that in a great way, it was as much Roger's movie as mine. First-hand accounts of them as human beings are also slightly different. You know, I would say to Ridley, go talk to these people for God's sakes. Because, you, you know, everyone is devoted to you, but they're devoted through fear. Whereas for Denis... I love him so many ways, let me count the ways. He's decisive, he's economical, he knows what he wants. Uh, he's not afraid to change his mind. I, I was talking with Hans Zimmer about this and, and we both agreed, we said, he's brilliant, he is one of the nicest human beings I've ever met in my life. But where these dissimilar directors intersect is their minimal use of CGI on their respective Blade Runners. Ridley because the technology didn't yet exist, and Denis because... There's nothing more boring for a director than to shoot a character in front of a screen. Yeah. Causing the movie to lean extensively on Weta Workshop, the same practical effects house as the Lord of the Rings trilogy. So in summary, Blade Runner's sequel was lovingly co-written by Hampton Fancher, or Fancher Hampton, shot by one of my biggest heroes, Roger Deakins, and was helmed by an angel of a director, insistent on using the same kind of practical effects as my favorite movie trilogy. But despite how truly gumdrop idyllic as that sounds, I didn't like it. I did not think it was a good sequel, and by now you know the arc I'm about to undergo, but for the present moment, I am now the villain. But in my defense, despite its creators paying lip service to the kind of ambiguity I love about the first film, despite its plot unspooling a similar mystery about its protagonist's identity, where the original Blade Runner ultimately left its question up to the audience, Blade Runner 2049 answers its question in an even more unambiguous fashion than Ridley Scott's bullshit unicorn. 
The closest thing to ambiguity I felt it had was just unsatisfyingly unresolved plot points. Things like Wallace's lack of a character arc and the clumsy replicant revolution scenes prompted me to impotently jot down as soon as I got home from the theater. Blade Runner 2049 felt like the first three hours of a boring four-hour movie. All of those elements felt half-baked. It didn't feel like a satisfying sequel to me because its visual spectacle overwhelmed its story. But then I realized, that's the most Blade Runner thing possible. Even Blade Runner's creators have said, you gotta go with Ridley, but I still wish it had a better narrative. For me, it still emotionally falls short of total satisfaction. It's such a strong, unique world. In a funny kind of way, it overshadowed the story. But to be clear, I'm not saying Blade Runner 2049 is good because it's bad. I'm saying that where it's bad, it's faithful. And it's a lot better than I thought it was. It does what the best sequels do, which is to inhale the themes of its original and exhale them into different shapes. 2049 does have ambiguity, but since it would have been repetitive if K's own identity crisis ended as ambiguously as Deckard's, it instead externalizes the ambiguity into elements peripheral to our primary protagonist. Like, is Joy quote unquote real? Does her and K's relationship amount to that between a human being and a robot, or are they actually soulmates, as in mates both possessing souls? In the writer's own words, they took the core question of the original Blade Runner, quote, how much time do I have left, and pushed it to its next natural subway stop, which is, quote, how do I live my life and how do I make it meaningful? You can decide for yourself whether my changing opinions on this movie are valid or if I'm a hostage falling in love with his captor. It doesn't matter because it pulled off the immersive Blade Runner experience. It made me hate and then love it. And I think that's why Blade Runner can often give such a bad first impression. They're movies that are either half-baked if you're feeling mean or open-ended if you're feeling kind. They require active participation from their audience, which understandably can sound annoying. Someone who participates in a double shift at a hospital probably doesn't want to participate in the films they watch. Most people aren't asking for more challenges in their day, but if you are, Blade Runner's a cool one. A lot of people, myself included, still don't believe that Rick Deckard is a replicant, which is significant because Blade Runner is the only movie I know where a large portion of its fan base both passionately loves it and vehemently disagrees with its director. When you're watching the end of Star Wars and you see Force Ghost Alec Guinness, you don't go, he's not actually a Force Ghost, he's really a fart. But you do that with Blade Runner and it's amazing. It's, it's embarrassing to say this out loud, but Blade Runner changed me as a person. I, I used to view that initial dislike felt by me and Philip K. Dick and Ridley Scott and the world as a period on the end of a sentence, but it's now much more of a semicolon. No one really knows what it means, but it implies something else is going to happen. And not everything gets a semicolon. Nickelback, for instance, but Blade Runner introduced me to something that has since proven true across my favorite music and TV and video games. Many of the most fulfilling relationships I have with the art that means the most to me is this artistic Stockholm Syndrome, or as I call it, ass. I love ass. Ass has changed my life. And if you're willing to give it a try, I think ass might just change yours too. Because if after all of this, you still don't like Blade Runner, just remember, you will. <laughs>